So recently a viewer asked me whether you could get through all of university just running Linux. And today I'm going to actually try to answer that question. Now I'm not going to be talking about anything that is, I guess, software engineering specific. I'm going to be talking about more general programs. So the writing software that I run, my email client, my notes, things like that, that are going to be relevant to basically every single uni degree that you could possibly do. So if you're new to the channel, you know what to do and let's jump right into it. So. If we jump back to my main screen, I've actually got a list of stuff here. So normally I wouldn't plan out this much, but I thought it would be a good idea to actually do that. So the first section we have here is writing. So in the writing section, I've got NVim. So NVim is going to be my actual editor. So that is just, it's, it's basically Vim. It's a better version of Vim pretty much. And I've got my plugins and stuff set up for code editing, but those aren't going to be there by default. So the reason I like NVim is because it's just, it's just Vim basically, it's better Vim. And because of that, I'm gonna have to do some extra stuff to actually be able to make documents that are gonna make sense to actually submit to anyone because no one's gonna want a plain text document submitted for an assignment. So that's where some different ways of actually writing text come into play. So I've got three listed here. So Markdown, Groth, and LaTeX. So Markdown you've probably come across, so that's where you do things like, uh, this would be how you do like dot points, put things near for dot points, is how you do a, a header. You've probably come across Markdown before. And then Groff is another sort of way to actually write text. So Groff is actually the way that man pages are written. And if you want a good explanation of how Groff works, go watch Luke Smith's video on it. I haven't done a video on it just yet. And if I do want to use that, I would have to probably do a bit of a refresher for me. So the reason I have Groff on there and not just Markdown and LaTeX, because you could probably get away with just doing those two. So Markdown for like, general documents and then LaTeX when you actually need to do things like a proper thesis because don't write a thesis in like an office program it's a very bad idea you're just gonna end up having to redo all of your footnotes and redo everything all over and over again just do that in LaTeX it's way easier but the reason I have Groff on there is it's kind of a middle ground between the two Groff is a very simple way to write very complex documents. So I'll think about using Groff, but right now I'm probably going to focus on Markdown and LaTeX. If I decide to try out Groff, then that'll be something I probably will do everything in then. So I've also got the LibreOffice suite listed on here. So this will be if I need to use a, like a docx thing or a doc file. I don't typically want to use a rich text editor, but on the rare occasions I'm going to have to, LibreOffice is probably the best choice to use because there are some other alternatives, but then you start getting into more proprietary software. So I've also got Google Docs and Office 365 online on here. So if you have to do collaboration on documents, yes, there are ways to do it on Linux and there are ways to set up your own service to do this, but most people aren't going to want to do that. Once you get into the realms of collaboration, you're probably better off just using something that works. Unless everyone that you know happens to be a Linux user and happens to be like into super hacky stuff, just use something that works. And then if you absolutely have to have properly formatted docx files because occasionally LibreOffice won't actually format them properly, just use Office 365 online. So you can actually run Office 365 through your web browser. You don't actually have to download the apps, which is nice for when you're on systems that don't have supported apps, specifically Linux in this case. So next up we have email. So here I have two different things listed. I have Thunderbird and I have Mutt. So Mutt is basically a terminal-based email client and it's really, really good if you just want an email client, but I'm personally not the biggest fan of it just because Thunderbird is a really good piece of software. So Thunderbird is a GUI based email client by the Mozilla team. And I think it is just really, really good. So nothing too special here, it's just an email client. It might be a little finicky to get certain email servers actually working with it. My university uses Outlook and it, it took me like three or four attempts to actually get it connected. Depending on what your university uses, it may be easier or maybe harder. If you go through Gmail, for instance, you are going to be in a lot of trouble because it's it's a pain to get Gmail working with Thunderbird. But if you're using something that's more open, it's probably going to be a bit easier. So I like Thunderbird. And if you saw here, I also have, if you're using Mutt, then use CalCurse. So CalCurse is a terminal-based calendar app. So if you're in Mutt, you probably also still want a calendar. So just 
run Calcurse because that's another terminal-based calendar, and it's pretty good. But the reason I don't have that there for Thunderbird is because it actually has a calendar built into it. And there's a bunch of other add-ons, but I'm just running standard Thunderbird right now, so I'm not sure what else you could do with those add-ons. You can probably do a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be listing later just in Thunderbird. So for notes, we have Joplin listed here. So I like running the terminal version of Joplin. This is actually running in Joplin right now. So if I just bring up Joplin over here. So this is just what Joplin looks like. Nothing too special. I've done a video on this before. And basically, it's just it's just a terminal-based notes app, basically. Nothing too special. There is also a GUI version, which is very similar to something like Evernote. So if you want a open-source Evernote equivalent, I would recommend Joplin. It is a really good piece of software. So next up, we have my web browser. So honestly, in this category, you can just run whatever you want. The reason I recommend Brave is because Brave is just really good. The only thing I don't like about it is that it is Chromium. I wish there was a Firefox build, but we can't have everything, I guess. So basically, Brave, if you haven't heard about it already, it will actually pay you in crypto as you're surfing the web. And it also has a built-in tracking blocker and ad blocker and things like that. So it is just so much quicker than every other browser that I've tried. I'm going to be doing a full dedicated video on Brave at some point, but it doesn't really matter what you run. Personally, I like Brave, but if you want to run Firefox, if you want to run Qt, or you want to run anything else, Surf even, just run whatever you want. I like Brave though. So next up, we have my PDF reader. So for this, I'm using a very simple PDF reader. There, It has absolutely no frills. It is Zathura. By default, it doesn't even actually read PDFs. You have to download the PDF add-on for it. So I'll just quickly bring up a PDF to have a look at. So let's just go in here into my document. And I've got my textbooks here. So let's just bring up this random one here. So basically, it's a no-frills PDF reader. It doesn't even have like a cursor in there. You can highlight stuff, but you can't really select stuff as you would with a more feature complete PDF reader. But if all you need is to read PDFs, this is really all you need. So I'm a big fan of Zathura, and basically it's just a good program. It also has support for EPUBs and other sorts of file formats like that, but you have to download the plugins for those as well. So for my image viewer, I've got SXIV. So this is a really cool image viewer. So if we just go over to my images folder and just bring up something random. So nothing too special. It's just a very lightweight image viewer. It can actually do a lot of stuff besides viewing images. I'm not going to go into that, but as just an image viewer, I'm a really big fan of it. If you want another really lightweight image viewer to use, I would recommend using something like Fe. I prefer SXIV though. So next up we have MPV as my video player. So I would recommend not using anything besides MPV. Like I know there are front ends for it like celluloid and other things like that. But honestly, if all you need is a video player, MPV is probably the best choice. It is really lightweight. It, it does nothing but be a video player and basically it's all you need. So if I just go to the correct window, if we just run something. There we go. It, it's a video player, nothing too special here. You've got a basic, basic interface with this build of it. And if you want to, you can just control it with your keyboard though, which is what I normally do. So yeah, that's basically that. So the reason I want that there is because if you need something to like watch your lectures back, because let's face it, nobody actually goes to their lectures. Everyone's going to watch them online if they have the option of getting a recording of it. So because of that, you need some sort of video player. If you want to use something else, maybe CVLC, which is the command line version of VLC. If you really want to, I guess you can run VLC. I don't like VLC though, because I've had some problems with it with anime in the past, but run whatever you want. I like MPV. It's just really light and does basically nothing but be a video player. So I mentioned lecture recording. So I don't know if other universities do this, but mine will actually upload an RSS feed of all the lectures that are released. So you can actually get an RSS feed for each of your courses. So for that, I'm using Newsboat. So it's just a very, a, actually two basic RSS feed reader. So I haven't set up Vim keys in it, which is annoying. So I have to use my arrow keys. But if I just bring up one of these, and if we look in here, I've got a link to the video in here. So if I just copy this, go into a new window and then go MPV and then just paste that in 
and give that just a second and that should then open up that stream in MPV. And there we go. So obviously you could download them, but if you're only just going to watch them once, you might as well just stream it with MPV or whatever other video player that you want to use. So. I don't know if other universities do this with a RSS feed. I think this is really cool. And if your university uses an RSS feed like this, I would really recommend using it. Obviously, there are plenty of other uses for an RSS reader, like if you want to get your news or anything like that. That's also an option. But for me, I'm just using it for my lectures. So next up, we have our music player. So yes, I am running Spotify. I really like Spotify. I don't really care that it's proprietary software. I don't... I honestly don't care. I like Spotify and I'm happy to pay for music like that. So because of that, I've got the AUR package installed. I don't have the snap installed right now because the snap, it stopped working and I can't work out what is wrong with it. It's saying that I don't have an ulcer comp file, but I list out the file and it is there. So I don't know what's happening, but the AUR package, it's faster and it just works perfectly well. So. Yeah, nothing too special about this. It's Spotify. If you've ever seen Spotify, you can use that. I think there's also a Debian package for it. But if you're on anything else, then if you want to run it, you could try to get it running yourself or just use Spotify through the web client. That's also an option. But if you're someone who prefers to have locally stored media, then I would recommend a combination of MPD and NCMPCPP. That's a mess of a name. It's a really good terminal music player, or you could do something like CMOS or literally anything else. If you prefer GUI programs, however, I've tried out Clementine, that's pretty good. I don't really know about any other GUI music players, so let me know if any of the others are pretty good, but any of these two are pretty good, or Clementine's also an option if you prefer GUIs. So for communication, I've got Discord, Slack, and Messenger. So I would like to drop Messenger from that list, so that's Facebook Messenger. But I've got too many people that just don't want to leave it. I would happily use anything else, like WhatsApp, or honestly anything else, to be honest. Like, if I could get people on Telegram, I would happily use that. But that's not going to happen. So for everything else, though, I've got Discord. So Discord... I use for my YouTube channel and I use for basically chatting with most of my mates and then for more professional stuff I've been trying to get for especially my assignments getting people to use slack so slack is just a good alternative none of this is obviously open source software and I, I don't really care to be honest yes I could use an IRC client yes I could use a bunch of other stuff no I don't really care because I don't have anyone to talk to on those systems so because of that I'm just gonna happily use what I use and then lastly, for a VM is VirtualBox. So I think a VM is very important for every single degree in university if you're running Linux, just because there are going to be times where you just come across software that you can't run for whatever reason. And not just if you're on Linux. It's also important on Windows. So last year, I had a course where I had to do iOS development. And at the time, right, like right at the start, I was on Windows. And then I switched to Linux in between that course. So... Either way, I wasn't going to be able to access whatever the iOS development platform is called or the IDE is called. Um, I'll put it down below. You guys might know what it is and you're going to call me stupid for not remembering what it's called. Anyway, so I had to do iOS development and I didn't have a macOS system. So what did I do? I just set up a VM to do it. And you're probably going to, have to do that for a lot of stuff if you're using Linux as well because... There's going to be a lot of software that is Windows only. There might be a little bit, depending on how much your university relies on Macs. There might be some OSX only software, but generally I haven't run across that happening unless the course is specifically for development in the Apple ecosystem or working directly with the Apple ecosystem. Like if you're doing a video editing course and you have to use Final Cut, for example, then you're going to have to be on Mac OS to do that. But generally... Most of the stuff, as you saw throughout this video, you can get done on Linux, especially if you're just doing a degree where you have to do writing. If all you have to do is writing and research, there is literally no reason why you couldn't do Linux. Depending on what other sort of stuff you're doing, there might be a problem. Development, you'll find 99% of the time, unless you have to work within the Apple ecosystem or the Microsoft ecosystem. I can't speak for any other degrees. There's probably going to be problems in like artistic degrees. I don't know what sort of software they use, but I imagine there's a, probably a lot of the Adobe suite. So you might have some problems there. 
unless they'll let you use something like GIMP and Inkscape and things like that. So I think that's pretty much everything I want to talk about in this video. Obviously, as I said at the start of the video, I'm not going to talk about the technical stuff in this one. I'm going to be doing a separate video on that talking about basically the problems of doing development entirely on Linux when you're in university. But most of the time, it's going to be fine. The long and short of that video is that you can do it, but run a VM. So if you like this video, remember to smash that like button and leave me a comment down below letting me know what you think. So if you're new to the channel, remember to subscribe and ding the little bell icon down below because it'll really help the channel out. I'm now aiming for 10,000 subs and any help would be really appreciated. Up on that corner, I've got the playlist this video is in. So go check that out if you want to see other videos like this. Down below, I've got all of my social links. So if you want to chat with me on anything like Discord or anything else like that, go check that out. I've also got my support links. So if you'd like to support the channel, go check that out. And there's like a Patreon, a couple other things in there. So if you want to support the channel, feel free to do that. But obviously you don't have to if you don't feel like doing it. And I've also got my alternate video platform. So my library and my BitTube. So go check those out if you want to use something besides YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. And I'm out.